Hello, and welcome to The Morning Star of That Liberty, Controversy and Conflict in Early American Press, 1735 to 1805. My name is Isabel Hidalgo, and I am the curator for this exhibit, as well as an FAU History Department graduate student. Today, I will be guiding you through this exhibit. We begin first with an introduction. In 1638, printing was introduced to the American colonies in Cambridge, Massachusetts, Harvard College. Through the printing of sermons, pamphlets, books, and other materials, newspapers became commonplace about 75 years later. The first successful paper, the Boston Newsletter, subsidized by the British government and approved by the royal governor before publication, appeared in 1704 and until 1719 was the only colonial newspaper. By 1740, 16 newspapers existed in the British colonies, though all were weeklies. By the time of the American Revolution in 1776, some 37 newspapers, more than double the 1740 number, were in business. Newspapers, it was clear, were the voice of the new nation. English Traditions of Free Press By 1450, though information restrictions were lessened compared to previous centuries, printers needed a government or religious license to publish material. Into the 16th century, anyone in England found with unapproved books could face execution. During the mid-17th century, however, arguments mounted against licensing, promoting freedom from censorship as a natural right. After William and Mary's 1688 Glorious Revolution, the Declaration of Rights implementation created a more open society, and an explosion of print resulted. In 1695, the Licensing Act lapsed, and limits on the freedom of the press were transferred to the courts, where seditious libel charges could be leveled. In the colonies, these ideas would trickle into revolutionary governmental ideology, and into ideas of press freedom. English Traditions of Free Press John Milton Aside from an overall history of free press advocacy, specific texts were also key to colonial press influences. In 1643, for example, the Ordinance for the Regulating of Printing, known as the Licensing Order of 1643, instituted pre-publication censorship in England. John Milton argued forcefully against this form of censorship in Areo Pagitica. His central argument was that the individual can use reason and distinguish right from wrong, good from bad, but to use this ability, the individual must have unlimited access to his fellow human's ideas in, quote, a free and open encounter, end quote. From Milton's writings developed the concept of, quote, the open marketplace of ideas, end quote. Although at the time it did little to halt censorship, it would later be seen as a significant milestone in press freedom. The Colonies Located along the eastern coast of the present-day United States of America, the North American colonies were various land settlements begun in the early 17th century, primarily by Great Britain. Governmentally, British North American funding was under the jurisdiction of joint stock companies operating under royally granted charters. In other words, the king often granted large tracts of land to wealthy speculators or corporations in the form of this royal charter. Governmental systems and status could then shift based on British political and economic activities. The colonies also included diverse religious and spiritual practices, from the Puritans to Quakers, among other diverse aspects of culture, ethnic makeup, political ideology, and economic engagements. Early Colonial Printing Prior to 1735, American colonial print was mostly relegated to documents and other readings, but few newspapers. Some scholars have cited public mistrust as a reason for the lack of popularity in this early period. However, other reasons, including small populations, significant rural areas, and geographic distance, also made printing difficult, as did the laborious process of printing itself. Additionally, Early papers were mostly nonpartisan, as newspapers sought to gain as many readers as possible, and voicing a concrete opinion was almost certain to anger the elites and colonial officials, and even some of the common people, if they did not agree. 
Crown versus John Peter Zenger, 1735. Following the tradition of the English press, challenges to British authority in the press became a mainstay of the colonies. Among such conflicts, legal battles were some of the most common. Crown versus John Peter Zenger, or the Zenger Trial of 1735, stands as a landmark case in America's road to the protection of freedom of the press, being one of these first successful legal challenges to governmental control over the press in the colonies. Zenger Trial Background In 1731, William Cosby assumed the post as royal governor of New York. Immediately, his demand for the interim governor's salary caused immense conflict in the courts. New York's chief judge, Lewis Morris, issued a dissenting opinion, and displeased with this, Cosby removed Morris from office. Morris and close allies, attorneys James Alexander and William Smith, set up the province's first independent newspaper, the New York Weekly Journal, with John Peter Zenger as the printer. They hoped to lampoon and satirize the Cosby administration, which they accused of tyranny. Angry and failing to gain grand jury indictment, Cosby and his allies in the court issued a bench warrant for the arrest of John Peter Zenger, despite his only printing the writings. On November 17, 1734, the sheriff arrested Zenger and took him to New York's Old City Jail. Zenger Trial Events Zenger's allies secured preeminent colonial attorney Andrew Hamilton of Philadelphia to represent him. Hamilton's defense for Zenger was jury nullification, arguing that the jury could determine both fact and law, making this a question of liberty. The jury returned a verdict of not guilty. The Zenger case did not establish legal precedent and seditious libel or freedom of the press. Still, it influenced thoughts on free press. A half century after the Zenger trial, as members of the First Congress debated the proposed Bill of Rights, the great-grandson of Lewis Morris, Governor Morris, wrote of the Zenger case, quote, The trial of Zenger in 1735 was the germ of American freedom, the morning star of that liberty which subsequently revolutionized America, end quote. Colonial Press 1735 to 1765. In the years between the Zenger trial and the eve of the American Revolution, the press remained largely in flux. The colonial press of this era was one of experimentation and risk, with printers attempting new methods and ideas in their papers, such as entertainment sections with rowdy fictions, besides allowing almost any who desired to be published to appear in their newspapers even at the risk of governmental disapproval. Colonial Press – Experimentation Throughout this era, the colonial press underwent experimentation in format and content. Although colonists had originally been wary of the press, this era saw an increase in entertainment sections, the advent of magazines, advertising portions of papers, legal notices, and battles of will through opinion pieces. This wider use originated partly from the efforts of William Parks, among other printers, who had slowly introduced economic, local, and other events into newspapers before beginning more experimental approaches, which other printers soon followed. Colonial Press Conflict The colonial press of this period was not without conflict. Various printers, controlling the content of their newspapers, sought the best ways to keep their companies afloat in an era when newspapers frequently failed. Feuds could arise between once close friends and even family members who might open competing newspapers. William Bradford III, the creator of the Pennsylvania Journal, notoriously argued with his stepmother, Cornelia Bradford, after his adopted father passed and she was the new head of the American Weekly Mercury. Business, interpersonal, and other disputes made the survival of a paper all the more difficult. The South Carolina Gazette An example of both risk and conflict in the period between 1735 and 1765 lies in the South Carolina Gazette. Begun in 1732 by Thomas Whitmarsh and continued in 1734 by both Benjamin Franklin and Louis Timothy, 
The two ran the South Carolina Gazette until Timothy's death in 1738. His widow, Elizabeth Timothy, ran the paper for some years afterward, as her son, Peter, the heir to the press, was not yet of age. The Gazette appears in litigation in the 1740s, as Elizabeth published a controversial letter associated with Reverend George Whitfield. Fifteen-year-old Peter, named as the printer, was whisked away to court with the Reverend and the letter's author. All eventually made bail. Despite this run-in, a couple of decades later, Peter Timothy took over the press and became a vehement supporter of the American Revolution. Colonial Press – Risk The last major theme in the colonial press of this period revolved around risk. As seen in the Zenger trial and in other court cases of the period, like that of George Whitfield and Peter Timothy of the South Carolina Gazette, government and elected officials did not always approve of the opinions published in newspapers. Though outcomes of such cases usually favored printers, such legal actions still risked the printer's livelihood. Worse, when stamp taxes began to apply in the colonies and continued growing tensions, only a few printers had the ability to protest, and even these were largely ineffective. The Patriot Press the Patriot Press refers to the various pieces of media opposing the King and Parliament printed after 1765. The press galvanized public support for the revolution by controlling public opinion through propaganda, new ideas, and rumors. Two major types of print shaped the political processes of the American Revolution, pamphlets and newspapers. Printers acted like modern newswires, carrying the same story from city to city and providing shared political experiences. Anonymity was a key feature during this period by allowing writers to use a pseudonym, protecting all involved, the writer, the publisher, and the concept of a free press. Patriot Press, Common Sense. Common Sense by Thomas Paine is, undoubtedly, one of the most well-known Revolutionary War documents. It is also equally important for its history with printing and author permissions. Paine was wary in giving publishing permissions for his work, a concern which surfaced in Paine's conflicts with printer Robert Bell. Originally, Bell printed the pamphlet, but conflicts over profit led Paine to cancel his contract, moving to William and Thomas Bradford's press. Bell continued publishing Common Sense, its popularity incentivizing this piracy. In the end, Common Sense sold over 120,000 copies in its first three months, and by the end of the Revolution, 500,000 copies were sold. It is no surprise, then, that in the Weiner Collection, we have nine different editions. Patriot Press Poetry and Hannah Griffiths Among other aspects of the Revolutionary Era press were those who wrote shorter poems and other pieces. For example, a woman named Hannah Griffiths wrote the Female Patriot, a poem calling on women to support the Patriot cause, created seemingly only for her friends. However, one of her friends enjoyed the poem so much, she had it published in a few newspapers, including the Pennsylvania Gazette. The poem was originally signed anonymously by a female. Revolutionary activities of women printers and writers like that of Hannah Griffiths are examples of the important but often neglected roles women held in this era. Patriot Press, the Stamp Act. The heart of colonial printing and press tensions lay in the national debts England amassed fighting Spain and France in the Seven Years' War. To help defray costs, Parliament passed the Stamp Act in 1765, taxing all colonial publications, legal documents, and even playing cards. The tax jeopardized the revenue of newspaper printers and lawyers. Colonial printers united in opposition, but not in methodology. A few suspended publication rather than affix a stamp. Some published without titles, others simply printed without the stamp. The Stamp Act had the critical impact of politicizing printers and turned them into influential sources of information. Loyalist Press with rising tensions, newspapers played an increasingly prominent role in inspiring patriotic feeling. Still, all news has two sides, and the colonial era was no exception. 
Loyalist Press refers to the newspapers, pamphlets, and other materials created by those individuals loyal to or preferring to stay with Great Britain. In other words, these individuals and presses were diametrically opposed to the, to the Patriot Press, though they operated in similar ways. Loyalist Press, Samuel Seabury. The first American Episcopal Bishop, Connecticut-born Samuel Seabury was a Loyalist advocate and fierce opponent to Alexander Hamilton. Seabury's well-known pamphlet, Free Thoughts on the Proceedings of the Continental Congress, was initially written anonymously, signing this collection of letters as A. W. Farmer, a Westchester farmer. After the war, despite his Loyalist ideologies, Seabury remained in the colonies. Still, his most scathing commentary shows his reluctance to abide by the new order. Quote, If I must be enslaved, let it be by a king at least, and not by a parcel of upstart lawless committee men. If I must be devoured, let me be devoured by the lion, and not gnawed to death by rats and vermin. End quote. Loyalist Press, Daniel Leonard. A lawyer and loyalist, Daniel Leonard's pseudonym was Massachusettsis named for his state of birth. His rival was John Adams, who answered Leonard's letters in the Boston Gazette. Leonard left the colonies, at that point now independent, with the British soldiers at the end of the Revolution, and eventually, after much movement across British territories, became governor of Bermuda, where he admitted to writing the letters. The Boston Massacre Colonial tensions finally came to a head on March 5, 1770. A small crowd assembled in front of the Boston Customs House to taunt the British soldiers on patrol, jeering until one of the guards struck a man named Edward Garrick on the head. He cried for help, and soon the church bell sounded. Several hundred colonists responded, marching towards the Customs House. Eight British soldiers came to assist, but only provoked the crowd into more shouting and cursing. They pelted the soldiers with snowballs, ice, and stones. Shots were eventually fired, and five Americans died, with six more injured. The Boston Massacre – Patriot Opinions The press's uproar after the massacre was immediate and intense. Samuel Adams used the opportunity to raise his reader's temperature in the Boston Gazette, elaborating on this tale of another British act of cruelty. Two weeks later, the publishers of the Boston Gazette, Eads and Gill, hired Paul Revere to memorialize the event with an engraving they advertised and sold in their paper. Revere's engraving is considered one of the most impactful pieces of propaganda in American history. The Boston Massacre, British and Loyalist Opinions The British and Loyalist reactions to the massacre are not completely clear. It is certain, however, that they understood the gravity of the situation as it affected colonial relations. Overall, opinions seem to have been overruled by the repeal of the Townshend import duties, and past that, articles in the Boston Evening Post, for example, attempted to persuade Americans that negative feelings toward Mother England were unfounded. Complexities in Press Although the press seemed solidly divided into two sides during the revolutionary period, many in the Patriot press vacillated between Patriot and Loyalist spins in their papers. Benjamin Town in Philadelphia, for example, changed the Pennsylvania Evening Post to become a Loyalist-focused paper when the British took the city. Once among the first newspapers to print the Declaration of Independence, a need for business and personal survival motivated the shift in tone. With a British government in place, many like town thought it unwise to continue operating as Patriot papers. Thus, clear-cut divisions between Patriots and Loyalists were defined by far more practical reasons than might at first be suspected. Federalists, Enlightenment, and Freedom of the Press After the Revolution, the need to form a unified government took center stage. The idea of a free press was key to the formation of the fledgling United States. The framers of the U.S. Constitution viewed freedom of the press as integral to ensuring participatory democracy. The Constitution states, albeit with little detail on application, that, quote, 
Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of the press, end quote. Though free press had been a long-established precedent, the Founding Fathers studied the writings of Enlightenment philosophers such as Montesquieu, Hume, and Condorcet to create this aspect of the Constitution. By 1787, nine of the 13 states had already provided constitutional protections for the press, though it was not until the Bill of Rights that explicit free press became a part of the Constitution. Free Press in a New Nation Prior to 1788, partisanship in the press focused on American colonial, or patriot, versus British, or loyalist, ideologies. Old sentiments continued long-standing divisions and created new conflicts in the government. The newspapers became a battleground as citizens followed the debates between Federalists, Anti-Federalists, Republicans, and other emerging political parties. Free Press for Ratification In the period of Constitution ratification, whether as Anti-Federalist or Federalist papers, the press became deeply involved in the debate. Another well-known saying, quote, United we stand, divided we fall, end quote, became particularly visual as a forerunner of what we now consider as a meme. As depicted here, various newspapers across states published pictures of columns, labeling each column as a state that ratified, and the current state considering ratification as the final column. It then revealed the final column to be falling over and destroying the support system, in other words, encouraging unity in the choice to ratify the Constitution. Charles Holt and Political Printing as an example of press after constitutional ratification, Charles Holt and his generation of printers are standouts. Holt was a young printer in the late 18th and early 19th centuries, creating the initially nonpartisan paper The New London Bee in Connecticut. Holt, however, quickly realized how harsh the political climate was for Republicans in Connecticut, as most were Federalists. Holt operated at a deficit for the entirety of the Bee's run, but began to see a slight upturn in his business when he moved to the Hudson River Valley and became far more renowned in the press and political world. Much of his career centered around debating the Sedition Acts and from his press battles with Harry Crosswell's The Wasp, a paper the latter opened explicitly as political opposition. The Alien and Sedition Acts The next significant debate in the press were the Alien and Sedition Acts, a series of four laws passed by the U.S. Congress in 1798 amid widespread fear surrounding an imminent war with France. The Alien Act allowed President John Adams to deport non-citizens he believed to be dangerous, while the Sedition Act would strengthen national resolve and unity by criminalizing false and malicious criticism of the Federalist Party. At the heart of this opposition to the Sedition Act was a three-pronged view of the new American government. States' rights, limited presidential power, and free speech, all of which the Alien and Sedition Acts rejected. Virginia and Kentucky Resolutions the legislatures of Kentucky and Virginia passed these resolutions in response to the Alien and Sedition Acts of 1798. These resolutions were authored by Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, respectively. The resolutions argued that the federal government had no authority to exercise power not specifically delegated to it in the Constitution. Matthew Lyon a member of the House of Representatives from Vermont, Matthew Lyon was accused of violating the Sedition Act in 1798 after accusing President Adams of, quote, unbounded thirst for ridiculous pop, end quote. He was found guilty and sentenced to four months in prison and a $1,000 fine. He continued his criticisms from his jail cell and won a landslide victory in his re-election campaign. Benjamin Franklin Bach Grandson of Benjamin Franklin 
and a publisher of the Philadelphia Aurora, which fiercely criticized Federalist policies of George Washington and John Adams, Bach was arrested in 1798 under sedition, but died of yellow fever before he went to trial. The Election of 1800 Following the controversy of the Alien and Sedition Acts, the election of 1800 was one of the most bitter, contentious, and fiercely partisan presidential elections in U.S. history. At the time, it was unseemly for presidential candidates to campaign. Instead, campaign battles were waged between the partisan newspapers and pamphlets. These publications mercilessly criticized and lied about their opposition. Free Press in the Election During the Adams presidency, public discontent flared due to the Alien and Sedition Acts, a direct tax in 1798, and use of federal troops to crush tax rebellion. Jefferson, however, enjoyed popular support for his opposition to Adams' policies. Still, by the end of Adams' first term, brutal political cartoons and newspaper articles highlighted the growing discontent. The Federalists attacked Jefferson as an atheist who had no respect for religion. One paper warned that, during Jefferson's presidency, quote, murder, robbery, rape, adultery, and incest will be openly taught and practiced. The air will be rent with the cries of the distressed, the soil will be soaked with blood, and the nation black with crimes, end quote. Adams and the Press Adams received ridicule from two directions, from within his own party and by the Democratic Republicans. In an effort to encourage Federalists to drop their support of Adams and back Charles Pickney of South Carolina, Hamilton published a pamphlet, Letter from Alexander Hamilton, concerning the public conduct and character of John Adams. In this work, he argues that Adams was unfit for office, quote, on account of lack of sound judgment, eccentricity, inability to persevere, vanity beyond bounds, and a jealousy capable of discoloring every subject." End quote. This fueled Republican attacks on Adams as a hypocritical fool and tyrant. His opponents also spread the unsubstantiated story that Adams had planned to create an American dynasty by marrying one of his sons to a daughter of King George III. Supposedly, only the intervention of George Washington, dressed in his revolutionary military uniform, stopped Adams' scheme. Press and Scandals The election of 1800, with its myriad scandals and rumors, became the standard practice for future elections. James Callender was a political pamphleteer and journalist, though he can more accurately be called a scandalmonger. Thomas Jefferson employed him to attack John Adams and the Federalists. In the end, he turned on Jefferson and is now remembered for publishing the story of Jefferson's affair with the enslaved woman, Sally Hemings. This pamphlet by Callender was a partisan attack on various decisions of Congress, alongside various other scandals and accusations. The Reynolds Affair The bombshell scandal came in the pamphlet's chapters 5 and 6, where Callender revealed Alexander Hamilton's affair with Mariah Reynolds. Callender took it further, stating he believed the affair to be a cover-up to deflect from Hamilton's true sin, which was conspiring with Mariah's husband, James Reynolds, to loot the Treasury Department by manipulating the sale of stock certificates, costing Americans $50 million. Alexander Hamilton responded to Callender's pamphlet in his own, called the Reynolds Pamphlet, confessing to the affair and apologizing to those who lost faith in him, especially his wife. Hamilton denied the corruption charge, saying that Mariah and James Reynolds were extorting money from him. Hamilton's character was tarnished and he never held public office again. The Death of George Washington The death of George Washington allowed the newspaper to be not only a place of scandal, but a source of unity. The press became a newswire, publishing various orations and discourses, two of which are shown here. One of these was given by James Madison, and the other is an international French oration. 
Such press details were instrumental in bringing the new nation together and connecting all throughout the nation, and even internationally, through the despair of losing their first president. The People versus Crosswell, 1804. Into the 1800s, freedom of the press continued as a divisive issue. Harry Crosswell was a political journalist and publisher of the Federalist newspaper, The Wasp, in Hudson, New York. Crosswell published an article claiming that President Jefferson paid James Callender to run negative stories against his opponents. Frustrated by these articles, Jefferson encouraged state Republican administrations to enforce the Sedition Act, which he had so vehemently opposed just a few years earlier. New York Attorney General Ambrose Spencer, also one of Crosswell's targets, obtained Crosswell's indictment on charges of criminal libel and sedition. Crosswell's attorney, William Van Ness, sought to introduce evidence of the truth of the published statements, but the jury was instructed to only consider whether or not Crosswell published the statements. The jury found Crosswell guilty. Hamilton has the last word. Alexander Hamilton, who was unable to represent Crosswell at trial, brought the matter before the New York Supreme Court. In a six-hour closing argument, Hamilton advocated for freedom of the press, stating, quote, The right of giving the truth in evidence, in cases of libels, is all important to the liberties of the people. Truth is an ingredient in the eternal order of things, in judging of the quality of acts, end quote. The court was deadlocked, and the conviction stood, though Crosswell was never sentenced. In 1805, the New York State Legislature wrote Hamilton's argument into the state's libel law, breaking with English precedent that a statement's truthfulness alone is not a defense. Other states and the federal government followed Hamilton's argument, making these ideas a cornerstone of American libel law. To conclude, in the present day, we tend to assume that media spin, press-based conflicts, and other aspects of the controversial press are new ideas. Yet this exhibit and materials have highlighted that conflicts among early colonial presses, scandals like those of James Callender's infamous writings on various public figures, and most importantly, the consistent battle for freedom of the press are concepts as old and older than the United States as a nation. Freedom of the press has always been controversial, and the idea of who gets to control what is published has been on the minds of Americans before they thought to even call themselves Americans. In the end, we hope that this exhibit reveals some of the complexities of press and media, and how many of these issues remain with us today. Thank you. This exhibit could not have been possible without the valuable feedback, assistance, and support of Dr. Sandra Norman, Dr. Adrian Finucan, and Victoria Thur. Thank you to Teresa Van Dyke for her initial research and background, much of which forms the backbone of this exhibit. Thank you to Robert Feeney and Alethea Perez for their feedback and assistance. I would also like to note the works used as background for this exhibit. The Early American Press, 1690-1783 by Sloan and Williams, and The Tyranny of Printers by Pousley, with the Republic in print by Locheran as additional consultation. These sources' full citations can be found in the further reading section. A special thanks to The Weiner Family, the Marvin and Sybil Weiner Spirit of America Collection, FAU Libraries, the FAU History Department, and viewers like you. Disclaimer. All images in this exhibit, unless otherwise noted, are from the Marvin and Sybil Weiner Spirit of America collection. Further readings. Locheran Trish, The Republic in Print, Print Culture in the Age of U.S. Nation Building, 1770-1870, published in New York by Columbia University Press, 2007. Pousley, Jeffrey L., The Tyranny of Printers, Newspaper Politics in the Early American Republic, published by the University of Virginia Press, 2001. Sloan W. M. David and Williams, Julie Hedgepeth, The Early American Press, 1690 to 1783, The History of American Journalism, Number no. One, published in Westport, Connecticut, by Greenwood Press, 1994.